All right, let's see. Uh, how did you come to be in a band? Um, I first started playing music um, in, in like junior high school, playing in the school band, and then um, I met actually Trey from Morbid Angel in, in high school. So, uh, you know, we started talking about playing in bands together because we listened to the same kind of music back then. Oh, yeah. And um, so we just decided to put a little band together. It was actually called Ice. Um, and we um, we actually played like the school uh, talent show as Ice. It was me and Trey and a couple other people that were in that school at the time. And we played like cover tunes like Judas Priest and stuff like that, you know, uh, back yeah. then. But it was pretty cool. But that's um, that was the, the beginning of how I actually, you know, started to play music in, in, a, in an actual band. Nice. Um, how did you get into underground metal? Um, I, you know, I think just... Growing up listening to, you know, I've always liked the heavier stuff, like being that I grew up in the 70s, you know, the heavy stuff was like Black Sabbath and Led Zeppelin. They called these bands heavy metal back then. Right. You know, that was the heaviest that you had. And then you know, there were some record stores around my house that actually had, uh, there was one in particular, and, and the guy that ran it, it was called Asylum Records, and it was on Kennedy uh, Boulevard in Tampa. But the guy there, uh, I think, I believe his name was Fred, I think. But um, he was the owner, and he always, he loved import metal, and it was like when it was first starting. So he would always get these albums in. I remember when he got in, like, Number of the Beast, right. you know, Iron Maiden. And I remember when he got in, like, the first Angel Witch record, and he showed me that. Oh, you yeah. know, so he, he had things like that. So I, and, and then I, I actually bought the first um, uh, Merciful Fate EP, Nuts nice. Have No Fun, one, yeah, yeah. you know, when it first came out. So, I, you know, I, I, I was actually able to get stuff like that you know, right down the street from my house, which was kind of odd, you know, in, in, in the United States to even have yeah. you know, stuff like that. But we were lucky to have, or I was lucky, I should say, to have a, uh, you know, independent record store that, that carried stuff like that right by my house. So when I was like 14, 15, you know, still I used to ride my bicycle up there and buy records. <laughs> Hell yeah. So it was pretty cool. Hell yeah. Um, what is the coolest thing about playing in a band? I don't know. I, th I think just... You know, for me, it's it's just it's the um, energy you know that that the band can create when you're playing, because that to me has a lot to do with it. I mean, you know, a cover band is really good to go see, or a really technical good band. But when a band has like an energy about them when they play, that's the really cool thing that I see for myself. You know, to have happen. I mean, you actually become one unit instead of five different or four different musicians up there playing instruments, you know, playing a song, yep. you actually become one thing at some times. And, and when that happens and it gels just that much and in front of people when you're playing and things like that, it's there's nothing, no kind of experience like that, you know, when, when four or five people or however many are in the band, you know, actually come together as one unit and just, you know, really gel that much in front of everybody else. And, you know, I think the audience knows when that happens too, which is yeah. kind of cool. And, and then their energy and your energy gets together and you have this big vortex of craziness going on. And that, that to me, is the awesome part of playing playing music all together. Hell yeah. Uh, what's the worst thing about being in a band? Uh, just dealing with the business end of it and, and the people sometimes that, uh, you know, they get in bands and you start playing bigger and bigger shows and people's attitudes, you know, people that you've known for your whole life, their attitudes just completely change and they start becoming this different person. And it's, it's terrible to see that happen to people. And I it's agree. like, you know, I, I if I had $10 million, I'd be sitting here in the same T-shirt, these same jeans, you know, and, and maybe a bigger house. But, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know, right. I mean, exactly. I, I would right. still be the same person. Right. And, and it doesn't matter what I go through or what I do, I'm still me. But I've seen people just completely change in, in their lives, um, you know, just because the band starts getting a little, even sometimes a little successful locally. Right. And it happens, and, and, and it gets worse when you get somebody that's never done anything, they get in a band, and you start touring, and they just start, you know, their head just swells up so big, it's terrible, you know, and, right. and it destroys bands. Yep. So I think that's the, the thing about that. Um, what are your goals as a band? To me, it's just, I think to be successful in the fact that you're writing stuff that doesn't like sound like anybody else you're right. doing your own music and it and it's it's fun to play covers don't get me wrong you know that's fun to do on the side every once right. in a while but you know as far as the goal of music is just writing stuff that 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 people appreciate and it doesn't sound like anything else that's ever come out oh yeah 
Um, do you make money or lose money playing in a band? I me, I've always lost money playing in a band. But you know, like I said, it's for me, it's not the money aspect or the, or the fame. I really don't care about that. I mean, I love meeting people. When I go places, I'm out in the audience the whole night. I'm not one of these type of people that sits in the backstage or on the bus and just waits there until right, right. then yeah, I yeah. come running out on stage then I play, <laughs> then I run and disappear again. You know, I like to be, I'm, I'm a regular right. metalhead myself, yeah, yeah, so yeah. I'm out in the crowd watching you know, the show, at everybody watching else's the shows as well. Yeah. You know, and, and I get people, oh, you know, come see us. And then, you know, I do, and then I go to their shows and, you know, they, right. they never come to my shows. Right. It's like, uh, whatever. But, you know, it's it, that's the way things are with, with the music thing. But that's that's the way I look at it. Oh, yeah. Um, outside of being in a band, how do you make a living? Me? I, I've had a job for most of my life in, uh, with the uh, city of Tampa. So I work for the water department. So it's a really good job. I've been there now uh, like 21 years. So. Hell, yeah. That's my main occupation. I don't make money at music. I, I make money, you know, at my regular job, and I do this because I like to do it. So I kind of, and that's the kind of cool thing sometimes, though, when you do have a job and you make money at that, and your music is a side project, and you're still a little bit successful with it, is that you really don't have to conform to what the record company wants you to do right. or anything like that. We write songs when we feel like it. We play when we feel like it. Right. And we're not being told you have to have this done by this particular date or you have to do this by, you know, you have to do this if you want more money or you have to, you know. It, the cool thing about the way I do things is I get to do my music the way I want to do it, how fast I want to do it, how slow I want to do it, wherever I want to do it, you know. And, right. and And that's the only good thing about, you know, that whole situation, you know. But being on the road for your whole life and, and uh, still not making hardly any money, you know, it's not it's not a great thing to have happen, you know, because there's very few bands that are really successful. Right. You know, to where they don't have to even worry about, you know, playing all year long too to actually make ends meet. Right. A lot of bands, you know, they're very successful, but the thing is they have to play, you know, three hundred dates a year, you know, to, to make enough money to live. Right. Oh yeah, yeah. And you for can't sure. keep that up for years and years and years. So a few bands have been able to, but it's a handful out yeah. of the thousands that are out there. Right, right. So, you know, it's 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 kind of, I've found a good balance of keeping a job and and being able to be in a band that's, you know, that does things, you know, yeah. times a year. And I think it's a little more special sometimes that way. Like, some bands tour so much that you've seen them five or six times now in that aspect, you know, and sometimes two or three times a year. Right. You get to see a band and they're from out of town. Yeah. So, I think sometimes if you if you play shows just more sporadic, and festivals and things like that, it makes your band look a little more special. Yeah. Definitely makes people want to come out more if you're not playing that, that yeah, often. Yeah, if, so. if I can see you next weekend, it's like... Right. <laughs> exactly. Um, what is the biggest crowd you've ever played for? Actually, just this year, I mean, uh, we did Hellfest, and the shirt I'm wearing here, actually. Oh, yeah. And uh, it was in France, and there was 110,000 people there. Uh, we played in a tent, though, which held about ten or 12,000 people. So, you know, even though there was a lot of people at the festival, there was only so many people that got to see us under the tent. But it was still, I think, the biggest crowd I've been in front of as far as that. I mean, when I was in high school, of course, we, we did a couple... Our, our school band did a couple halftime shows for, for football games like the Bucks and nice. Miami Dolphins. So I've played in front of 50,000, 100,000 awesome. people yeah, in a stadium yeah. like that. But that was in a school band, too, <laughs> which awesome. is kind of funny. I so, didn't know that. That's awesome. Huh? Yeah. And, but, you know, this year we've actually done some really good festivals with, with thousands of people there. And, you know, it, it's been a really good year. And, and we're already talking to people next year about that, too. So it looks like next year we'll be going back to Europe and doing some more festivals. Hell yeah. Uh, what's the smallest crowd you've ever played for? I've done, you know, several shows where there's like just a handful of people there, you know. Sometimes there's all kinds of circumstances. Another show might be going on one night. But, you know, locally, people don't think the same, you know. Like even, even on tour um, in, in America, you get some smaller shows. And, right. and in Europe... You know, there was a show we did in Europe one time that was on a Sunday night, and it was in a small town, and there was no buses or trains going out late right. oh, yeah, at yeah. night. So, you know, we had literally had like 10 or 15 people there because of that. And, you know, 
and uh, because people were afraid that they, it was really cold. Oh yeah. And people were afraid that they weren't going to be able to get home. It was a Sunday night, and yep. so we just had a, a, you know, it happens. You get shows that have just a few people there, but then you know, it it you know it balances out. Yeah. If you're in a band, you never know. But you, I like playing music, so I play big shows, small shows. It's all about. Oh yeah. Um. My friend the other day I asked him, he's like, it's occupational hazard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was pretty funny. Um, well, you kind of kind of answered a little bit of it, but uh, does your band tour? If so, where have you been? And uh, how many times have you toured? And if not, uh, do you plan on touring? But you tour, but... Yeah, I've, I've You've toured, toured with off and on my whole life. Yeah. Back in the 90s, I did some touring with, with Nocturnus and... Um, we played Europe a couple of times back then, and and uh, and all the U.S. with with uh, Napalm Death and Godflesh on the Grind Crusher tour. That was like '91, and we toured again Europe in '92. And uh, then I, I let me see, we didn't do any touring with Asheron when I was in Asheron. But then when I got just actually just um, since I've had um, the Nocturnus AD thing this year, we've done you know quite a few things. We we went to uh, Europe. A couple of times we've been to um, South America, we've been to you know Chile and Mexico. Um, we're talking to some other places like Brazil and stuff like that now. So, you know, some places we haven't been yet, right? And and we're looking at that now. But yeah, we went we went to uh, we did some played in Maryland this year, the Maryland Death Fest. Um, yeah, in Holland or Netherlands, uh, France. Um, did a show in Belgium, and we just did the show in Berlin like two weeks ago. All right. Oh, yeah. Um, there's another one that went with that that I forgot to ask you, but it was going to be, uh, do you take your own equipment, or do you uh, rent stuff when you go on tour? Do you, like, like when you play, in, do you take to your own, or do they, um, yeah. how does that work over well, there? Well, in Europe, it, it, it's, it's different. You know, in the States, it's kind of, it depends on what you're doing, but for us, we've always flown the cheapest possible way you know so when we go to europe um basically all i bring is my my pedals my my bass drum pedals right my cymbals and and my headphone mic headset mic and that's about it and our guitar players they bring like their guitar and their effects pedals right and um like our bass player just brings his guitar and you know right. and i think they're wireless is right. our keyboard player he just brings his keyboard and that's it so but but um, yeah, we work down to a minimum with that, and you know, it depends on the festival. Like if it's a festival, they'll probably have the drums there already that right. everybody's using. Yep, yep. I mean, Hellfest was amazing when we went. I mean, and we're in the tents, which is the medium stages. Right. You went back there, and it was a huge tent, of course, with two stages in it. But you had five drum sets per stage <laughs> to yeah. pick from. So I, wa right. I literally walked back there and there were like five different drum sets sitting back there. Well, there was four because somebody was out there playing. Right. But they were like, uh, which one do you, you know, looks best for you? <laughs> and each one had its own drum riser with wheels. Nice. So you were literally back there putting your, your whole drum set together right. off the side of the stage, you know, on the riser, and then they just wheel it out <laughs> and plug the monitor in. Hell yeah. So, I mean, it, it worked really well. Right, but right, I right. couldn't believe they had like five different drum sets that you could, you right. know, actually choose yeah, to play yeah. from. And I, that was just to me amazing. Yeah, yeah. You know, okay. usually you get like, uh, you know, you get like, you know, you'll have a kit that's even like two different drum sets put <laughs> together just to make a double bass kit. They'll have like a five piece single bass and they'll put a, a completely different sized bass drum. Right. You know, completely different color. We yeah. just had that happen at the Nuclear War Now Fest. It was funny. It's like you have a 24 inch bass drum and like a 22 inch bass drum and one's like extra long and the other one's short. They're both different colors and, you know, it's like, <laughs> wow, you know, it, it's, it, you never know what you're going to end up right. playing on in, on tour and that's, you know, the more technical the music, the harder it makes it. Oh, yeah. I have to, uh, like, I use a lot of, like, you see my kit here. Um, if you want to pan over, I've got a lot of toms, and I like using them. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I've always used them in Nocturnus, and my, my bands, I like the high toms for the rolls and stuff. But, like, 90% of the time when we, when we um, you know, play a show somewhere out of town, or out of the country especially, you know, I'll never get this many toms right, to yeah. play on. So I have to adjust the songs every sing single night, the rolls, everything. I have to adjust everything every single night to how many drums I have. And, and so sometimes even here at practice, I'll do that too. I'll, I'll play with just 
these three toms or these four toms. Oh. And like, yeah, like what happened like uh, at the Nuclear War Now Fest, they told me we were going to have four mounted toms. Right. So I practiced the set with four mounted toms. Well, I get there, they had three mounted toms. Uh. And I'm like, you know, now i got to change the whole roles and everything again that I do and I have to refigure, configure everything. And so it's, it's like, it's kind of a pain in the butt to do it that way. I wish, I, you know, shipping is just so expensive, oh, yeah. you know, and especially now you get one extra bag and it's like a hundred dollars, you know, wow. each right. way to Europe, you know, so that's an extra $200 just to bring one extra thing, right? you know, so, you know, I used to bring like a little set of Toms with me back in the, in the Nocturnus days that, that, so I could get all those little rolls. You know, but nowadays you can't even do that. So I just have to kind of adjust the drums, you know, and the playing to whatever drum set I have. Oh, yeah. Um, all right. Uh, if you had to give a new band advice on being a band, what would you say to them? Um, just save your time and money. Don't do it. No. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, it's great to have, uh, if you're a new band starting out and I know you're going to have influences, you know, and that's, that's all and well, because I've had plenty of influences, believe me. But the one thing you want to keep in mind more than anything and try to remember this is to just don't be those influences, be yourself, you know, just try to create something that doesn't sound like everybody else. You know, I mean, there's bands that are, are, you know, aren't the greatest musicians out there, but just because they did something completely different than everybody else, they're 10 times more popular than the band of musicians that's better musicians. Right. So, I mean, to me, it's it's not always about how good you can play, how fast you can play, how this, but, I mean, and it, this may not make you more successful as far as money-wise, but if you want to feel your success inside yourself about, like, you know, did I do good with my songs? Are, do people really like them or are they just listening to them because they're on the radio this week? Right. You know, there's a difference. So it depends on what kind of band you want to be, you know, or what kind of musician you want to be. If you want to be a cover band, you know, then you have to obviously think differently uh, with what you're going to do. And, you know, you want to play bars for your whole life and pick up girls every weekend. That's one thing, you know, I mean, that's a one way to do it, you know. But if you're into metal, you know, which is probably most people will be watching this and, <laughs> And even the punk people, you know, in the punk scene, you know, they've never done it for the money. Right. You know, punk, especially the punk, they just like to get out there for the energy of the shows. Right. So I, I think, you know, that's the best thing for people to think in an upcoming band is, is besides from being original and, and then just when you get up on stage, just, you know, you have to, you know, really connect with the audience, too. Uh. Uh, how many releases do you have out? Oh man, I don't even know. <laughs> There's so much stuff. There's a lot of bootleg stuff too. But I mean, you know, I did one album with Morbid Angel, which was Abominations of Desolation, and that is an album. It's a full album. Right. Um, they like to call it a demo, but it is an album. Right. And and I did uh, two albums with Nocturnus and a couple of demos with Nocturnus, and and then I did two albums with Asheron. Right. And, and I did some small stuff, you know, in between that. And then and then I started with After Death around 2000. And I've had two releases with After Death that actually came out. Right. As Besides the demos, but like Retronomicon CD. And then the, the After Death, Unisprickling and Colton uh, split, which is now on vinyl. Oh, yeah. It's pretty cool. But, yeah, we, we just, uh, that's the, the two things for that. And now I'm doing Nocturnus AD, and we're in the process of writing new songs for that. Cool. Fuck yeah. Um, uh, is your family supportive of your musical career? Um, I know you have a uh, you have children. You're one of the few musicians that have children. Like, does your daughter understand what 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 you do? Yeah, the family thing is a little. I mean, I don't have a big family, so it's just really I have a mom. And my dad doesn't live anywhere around here, and I don't I haven't really talked to him in a long time. So it's mainly, and I don't really have brothers or sisters or anything like that. So I have a really, it's just really my mom right. and my daughter that I have now. And she's seven. So my mom helps me a lot, you know, with, with uh, certain things. And she doesn't really, 
she she's kind of weird about the band thing. She she likes that I do it, but then she doesn't like that I do it because she thinks I don't make you know money at it. So why do I do it? Right. But then you know I'm in Germany this weekend. I'm in France this weekend. You right. know it's like you know even though I don't make money on it, I love what I get to be able to do. Yeah, and yeah. You know, we've well, been in yeah. you know Chile another weekend, and we do these things over the weekends almost. You know, right? So mostly just four or five days, and we're back. And uh, you know, so I do them. Try to do a few a year. You know, so that the family thing, you know, my mom does help me and, um, you know, my daughter, she has her mom too, you know, that we split w with that. But um, being that she's seven, you know, my daughter is just starting to come into the fact of, she always known, you know, that I played in a band. She knows right. what that, she didn't know what it was when she was really little, you know, of course she knew I played drums. Right. But then she realized that I'm in a band and now she, she's starting to realize wow, they're in a band that actually goes places and does stuff, you know. And it's kind of, she's seen it on, you know, videos on YouTube and on the TV and stuff, <laughs> you know. And she's, like, starting to kind of realize, you know, what I do now yeah, right, with right. the band. And being that she's only seven in second grade, you know, she's just starting to realize the stuff. But it's kind of cool, you know, because she's seeing it all happen. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know? um... What is it like playing in multiple bands? Uh, how did you come to playing in more than one band? Well, I mean, at one point I was in like three different bands, you know. Um, but right now I've only have two bands, uh, which is After Death and, and Nocturnus AD. And the funny thing about that is it's all the same members. Which right. People have multiple bands, but it's usually not all the same members. But with After Death we do... Uh, I do a little bit different style. Of, well, I'll just say with Nocturnus AD, we keep with the Nocturnus style. Right. And everything else kind of flows over into the After Death style. Um, and I sing a little differently in After Death. Uh, the band is tuned in D in After Death. And in and, and, and Nocturnus AD, we're tuned in E flat, which is what Nocturnus was tuned in. Right. You know, and when we used to do Nocturnus songs in After Death, and they were played in D. Right. So they sounded heavier but they didn't sound exactly the same. Right. You know, so when when I started to do um, Nocturnus AD, which was just October of last year, you know, I've only been doing it for like a year now, and um, I, I told everybody we're going to have to change tuning, you know, because they wanted to do Nocturnus AD, you know, just just keep doing it in D like we've been doing. I said, no, we got to switch and go back to E flat, just like the band did, right. you know, back in the 90s. And we did that, and it actually did make a difference. You right. Know, the, songs, oh, yeah. the, the songs sound even more like i mean we play them pretty pretty close to the way it is on the album oh, but, yeah. but now they sound they sound even closer too not just the playing but the sound is is exact now too so that's kind of like the difference between the two bands that i do now how did you come to singing and playing drums uh you're one of the few people that can sing and play drums <laughs> yeah well that's that happened back in 1986 when i was in morbid angel we had you know we had First, our singer was the bass player, you know, Dallas, the original bass player in Morbid Angel. And then he got put in jail, and we replaced him with another bass player that didn't sing. Right. And then we tried out a couple singers here and there, and just nobody really fit. Their voice didn't really fit. And we, and we were, were really getting tired of, like, trying people and just not getting, you know, the right thing that we needed for Morbid Angel, you know? Right. And it was just so weird, I just said fuck it, I'll try it, you know, I'm going to try to sing, you know, and and, and just see what happens, you know, because I understood the music, you know, Trey and I both wrote lyrics, right? And, and and we were the only two that did, and for Morbid Angel at the time, it was just either he wrote something or I did, or we both put it together, right? you know, most of the songs, he wrote a lot of the lyrics, but I always added stuff, and I always kind of arranged it to be able to sing and play, right. you know, I have to arrange things the way I so I can sing and play at the same right, time because right, right. it's not an easy thing to do but <laughs> but it's it, once I get the song memorized it's much easier cause right imagine you know like taping up lyrics you know like on one of your drum stands or you know yeah, yeah. trying to read that while you're playing <laughs> it's, it's really difficult <laughs> so what I like to do is get like a recording like just a jam box recording of the song right write the lyrics to it and then actually do a quick little recording of me singing over it and then just start listening to that a lot. Right. And then I can kind of adapt it, you know, to playing and singing because I have to memorize it to really be able to get into it and play it. Oh, yeah, yeah.
But that's um, that's you know the way it, it started happening. I, we just got couldn't find anybody for Morbid Angel, so I bought a headset mic and just said, "Let me try it." And uh, since I understood the lyrics and you know what the songs were about, the feeling to the songs, you know, that are abom on Abominations of Desolation, you know that that album definitely has you know a feel to it, you know, really. Right. And, I... and you know the lyrics are all about the Necronomicon, and most people they wanted to sing for the band, but they didn't care about what you know we were into. Right. And you know we were into this stuff, so we really wanted somebody whoever was singing to be into it. Right. You know, so that's you know when I was a more of an angel, you know, I was like. I'm going to try singing because I know what these things are supposed to, I know the feeling behind the lyrics. You know, some of those songs are stories of things that have happened to us, you know. Right. And, and you know, during during working with magic and rituals and things like that. So, like, that, you know, when you write your lyrics out of experience, then you sing them, you know. It's, it's sometimes you sing other people's lyrics, you can under, you know, you can understand them in your own way, but they're going to understand them in their own way, too. But when you write your own lyrics, of course, and you're singing them, you know what they mean exactly. You know, you know where the origins of it all came from, and and so I think that was a big thing about the Morbid Angel, you know, and me singing, and and, and it is once, you know, I bought that microphone and just I started like almost like chanting along with the drums because the vocals. Another thing is that most people write a song, and the vocals go with the melody of the song. Right. But if you listen to all the stuff that I've done and sang on. The vocals go with the drums; they go with the beat instead right. of with the melody, right. which is opposite from most songs. You know, and and um, a lot of people don't. You know, we even in Nocturnus when we did get a guy to sing on the second record, we had a lot of people try to come out and sing for Nocturnus, um, and and they couldn't catch the timing of the songs because. It didn't go with the guitar, it went with the drums. <laughs> right, you know, I got everybody's yeah. like, you know, it threw a lot of singers off. Right, you know, because they're not used to that. But it's more like when you look at ancient times, the most ancient thing in the world is chanting and, and drumming. You know, it's very. It comes back to a very, you know, old style of 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 um, ritual almost. Yeah. You know, of of you know, I mean, the farthest back you can see people around a fire playing the drums and people frantically going nuts, you know, yep. and, and doing stuff, you know, like saying things. Um, so it's kind of like, that's the way I, I kind of view what I do, is like, it's like chanting and playing drums, you know, it's like very tribal, it's very ancient, you know, in, in the way it is. So my vocals are more like chanting than, than singing, you know, and, and, and it's very rhythmic. Hell yeah. Um... Have you ever had to play more than one show a night? Um, no, I don't think so. I mean, I, I've played, I did a band called Argus for a little while. I was in this band, and um, they were a really big band in Tampa in the 80s. And when I was in Morbid Angel, I used to go watch them back in the 80s, and they right. were huge. They actually broke up about 85, I think, or 84. And, um, and th those guys were a little older than me, even, and, you know, like I was 18 and going, just going to bars. Right. And, you know, these guys were in their 20s and, the, you know, they were playing like all around Florida and up the East Coast back in the 80s. Right. And they had their own little motor home and everything. Oh, nice. And, and they did a lot of originals, but, you know, they were like the heaviest band. They used to play Angel Witch live. They used to play a lot of, they did Black Sabbath medleys. So I really liked to go watch the band. Yeah. Sabbath, all that stuff, Scorpions, they did everything, you know, and the singer had a phenomenal voice. And uh, so I always liked watching them. And I, I I used to see the guitar player a lot, you know, off and on, um, you know, through the years. And I saw him one time in, around um, 2002 or something like that. And uh, I, I ran into him, and he's like, you know, we're going to put the band back together, but the drummer's the only one that doesn't live here out of the whole original band. And I was like, well, shoot, man, you know, I played drums, and I wasn't doing a whole lot at the time. I think I was only doing After Death. Right. So I decided to do Argus, you know. Uh, they asked me if I wanted to do it, and I, I played in the band about two years. And it was, I mean, when we did it, they had a few originals, um, but most of the stuff was cover stuff. But it was fun because, like I said, you know, it's not, if you want to do that as a second kind of project and but the vocalist was really good and the guitar players were great we did a, a sabbath medley that was like you know 12 13 minutes long of sabbath rhythms and you know a lot of judas priest we still did the angel witch you know which is kind of cool to play that as a cover yeah you know so um 
It was a band. I, yeah, I did do cover, you know, the cover band for a little while, Argus, and and you know, played in that, and it was uh, it was kind of fun, you know, doing those kind of songs, you yeah. know, getting Helps. to put your, your own little, you know, touches in the songs, and and having a, a real vocalist up there that sings that like he had a great voice, and and uh, but there's stuff on YouTube if you look up Argus. I know there's a few Arguses now. But if you look up the Tampa Argus, you'll probably find, you know, there's a couple shows up there uh, with me playing drums on it. I filmed one. I don't know yeah. if I put it online yet, but I know I, I remember filming Argus one night. Yeah, yeah, we played a few shows. All right, hell yeah. Um, was that the question? Uh, it was, uh, have you ever played more than one show a night? Oh, yeah, well, with Argus, though, we, we did. We had a couple shows. Uh, like I said, with Argus, we had a couple shows that were, um, we, we did it kind of cover so we played like two sets you know um but that was that was the only time you know other than playing you know i've always played original music except for the you know doing the argus stuff there and um so to me that was uh you know it was it was um we'd always just play a single show you know and then maybe an encore stuff like that but you know we never really did you know sets of music or multiple shows in one day yeah. Uh, does um well, does be, being in more than one band ever cause issues between the bands? Yeah, I mean it. It can. I mean sometimes you're you're when you are in two bands, it depends on the style of music that the both bands are. Because like when I did Argus and After Death, the styles were completely different, so they really didn't have any problems. And even the guitar player in After Death, he ended up. One of the guitar players had some uh, health issues, and he left for a little while. And so, one of the guys from After Death actually stepped into Argus for a little while and played guitar um, for us. Um, so that was kind of cool, you know. But I mean, sometimes it can help, you know, and sometimes right. it can hurt. Like if you have people that are in the same, you know, band in other bands, then you start getting competition for shows and things like that you yeah know, say a band comes through town that you want to play with and you have two bands it's like well which band right you know if you get asked hey does one of your two bands want to open for this band coming through town then you have to be like oh which one which one choose, yeah you know? and you know certain things can come up like that you know that's the main problem um is the competition with your own self really you yeah know, or your own other band right you know you got to kind of sometimes decide which band's going to do what yep um, have you ever had to play the same show with different bands and if so how do you keep from burning out um have I ever done that I don't think I've ever had to do that I mean we we, we were talking about doing it a couple times doing an after death and a um, nocturnus show in one weekend you know like right. or like go to a festival and one do one day do an after death set and one day do a nocturnus AD set we, we haven't really done that yet so I haven't had to worry about that happening. So, right. But um, that's, you know, it's possible that it could happen one day. Um, I think that was it, brother. Hell yeah.